The real estate industry is the world's single largest contributor to climate change. At Fifth Wall, we're on a mission to help the industry eradicate its carbon emissions and build to zero. Well, thank you for watching Building to Zero, uh, the series where we explore how we can innovate towards a future of carbon neutral real estate. Our guest today is Christina Gamboa, the CEO of World Green Building Council, which is a global network that works with businesses and governments to drive the ambitions of the Paris Climate Agreement um, and the UN Goals for Sustainable Development. So Christina, thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Brendan. I'm really excited to join and have a conversation with you today. I am as well. Where are you uh, coming in from today? So I am currently based in London in the UK, uh, but I'm from Colombia, from South America. Oh, nice, nice. Um, well, it, it probably will be a long time before we ever meet in person, so we'll have to get accustomed to speaking over Zoom. Um, but I've heard so much about, obviously, you and you know, the World Green Building Council. And I'd love to just hear your background, your story in sustainability. And also, like, can you just explain to people what the World Green Building Council does, what it's ambitioned to do? Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're too kind. So from my end, I am an economist by training. And I, I got into sustainability when I was seeking to have a career with a greater purpose. Yes, I was a lot into economic consultancy. I knew a lot about the built environment because I advised, let's say, the traditional trade guild for several years and set up census information, got into productivity studies, did a lot of that and other stuff. But um, let's say getting into the Green Building Council space happened for me in 2009 when I uh, was, let's say, one of the founding CEOs of the Colombia Green Building Council. Well, basically, I had to explain people what was a, a green building. There was like no record of it back then. So I, I grew up in, in a space where uh, a very conservative sector was exposed to new ideas. Uh, some of them did, uh, let's say, accept and, and get an uptake. And, and a few years on the horizon, I ended up here in, uh, in, on top of the World Green Building Council leading, let's say, a global network because we have managed to move the needle in several markets in terms of getting, getting actors to lead. So what does the World GBC do? As you said, we are a network of over 70 Green Building Councils around the world, uh, basically uh, accelerating the uptake of best practice and building up the business case, connecting the dots between responsible investment movement, policy, and whatever can unlock that the built environment delivers to the scale and speed that we need to meet, a, as you said, the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. It's so important, obviously, that work. And I imagine the challenge is, and I'm probably you know, telling you everything that you know, which is also what, what I live and breathe every day, which is the real estate industry, as, as an industry is obviously highly responsible for, for climate change, right? The, 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 the statistics speak for themselves, right? It's, it's one of the largest contributors of greenhouse gases, both in the embodied carbon, um, but obviously in the operations of a building. And yet it has been one of the industries that has somehow historically, at least, shirked the responsibility it should have around decarbonizing. And I guess my question is, why do you think that is? Why has the real estate industry, at least historically, not embraced sustainability to the same ex to the extent it should, but also to the same extent other industries have with kind of a forward posture? Hmm. Well, I think, Brendan, there are several barriers to that change, right? And I guess what we try to do as, as Green Building Councils and from the World GBC is to be a convener of all the different segments of the value chain and really get them to collaborate and take the responsibility to make the change happen. It, we, we have been hard to decarbonize as a sector because it is, if you think in economic terms, it's a local industry and it has been very conservative. All the McKinsey studies have showed year after year that the productivity levels of the construction industry worldwide don't change much. And so it's an industry that probably doesn't innovate that much on average, that probably it doesn't really have to be very competitive and innovator to be up at scale and speed with others. 
but but there are a few leaders, very brave leaders around the world that are taking up the challenge. And as we, we with the GBCs create markets and opportunity, we create this space for differentiation, for innovation, and of course, being true to the purpose of supporting the goals we know we need for a viable climate, for a viable cities, for livable cities. So that's what we do. And I think, I think there's a mix there in my answer of difficulties and opportunities, but I guess it's a hard space to move. It's a very different industry, city, city by city, country by country, on an average. It, sometimes it moves too slow to improve in any way. And as you mentioned, real estate is this kind of hyper local industry and, you know, the importance of climate change um, and the kind of political overtones to climate change obviously vary a lot, right? Country to country, city to city. Um, I guess, how do you think about just idea sharing, right? So a, a lot of, you know, the, the best ideas we're seeing seem to be coming out of Europe and, you know, less, at least historically, came out of the, the U.S., how do you think about just sharing ideas between green building councils, but also specific real estate owners where they can learn from regions that have successfully moved towards a carbon neutral future and how they can instruct those that are kind of in their wake to achieve the same? Totally, totally. It's about leapfrogging. <laughs> and, uh, you know, documenting really, really closely what were the keys to unlock that success? Probably there's great urban leaders worldwide. We see them in different city networks that are acting on climate as leaders and even going beyond what their national countries are doing, right? In this strange world we're living where populism is popping up and there's some odd <laughs> leadership going around. But those, those city leaders that unlock that possibility of improving the quality of life through better policies and regulations that go into, into providing a basis for sustainable practices, end up also inspiring others. And as that market signal is clear that that's the way the cities, the regulation is moving, that also inspires business to, to show the vision of the possible. Mm -hmm. And then that connection, business supporting a greater ambition and also the, the, the regulation showing a way forward creates like an ambitious loop, a positive ambition loop, sorry, that unlocks innovation and then this moves forward. And as we document that, then we get other networks to connect to that. We recently, for example, had a great project in the Asia Pacific region that sometimes is really conservative, tackling embodied carbon. And so we got our GPCs to have a conversation. What would it take to address embodied carbon in Asia Pacific? with a report we did a year ago. And then that way, and getting governments to understand the way forward, we get the different parts of the jigsaw puzzle, <laughs> at least to recognize each other and see the opportunities. And how do you think about the, the different vectors that are kind of colliding with the real estate industry around sustainability? Because you know I've had a lot of conversations with real estate owners and the rationale as to why they are today focused on something they didn't appear to be as little as five years ago, appears to be, as we just discussed, regulation, right? Oftentimes at a local level in the US certainly, because at a federal level in the last four years, we obviously haven't, um, we haven't been a part of the, the Paris Climate Agreement. That may change, but at a local level, you are seeing that interest. But then beyond that, you're seeing it from two additional sources. One is capital markets, right? And Real estate is this industry, which is, a, it is a capital markets driven industry. Cost of capital is deterministic, right, of one's success in the real estate industry. And some of the largest capital allocators in the world, sovereigns, pensions have said, we will preferentially give capital to low or no carbon impact real estate owners. And that seems to be instigating change. And on the other hand, we're seeing it from the, I guess you'd call it the consumer or the, the demand side for real estate, meaning both individual consumers that are renting spaces, but then also some of the largest corporations that have taken these really bold carbon neutrality pledges are saying, the real estate industry is a supplier to us. It needs to decarbonize. These are the standards it needs to uphold. And so if we were to kind of strip out altruism from this and just say, in a real estate owner's commercial best interest and independent of regulation, what are the drivers that you're seeing that are affecting this change? 
So I guess the stat would say, profit would say probably Brendan, 80, around 80 million people are at risk of flooding because of the rising sea level. And so if you look at from an asset class perspective, where are you gonna be investing your, your, your money? So it's the disclosure of the climate risks in real estate, right? So that's like the most evident one, but also real estate that is not future proofed towards a changing climate. It probably will be buildings that in 10 years will be obsolete and uncomfortable because of the changing climate. So what are you going to invest today in a building that was thought and on? Yeah, good practice has got, it, got us here, but it has not thought about how is that real estate portfolio gonna be performing in a life cycle perspective in a few years. So the shift is, all this conversation, it's not how do I invest in this, this tea time today, but in T plus 10, how is that real estate gonna be delivering the quality of a, the, yeah, the, the, how my asset is gonna be a, improving in its worth. Right. And if, if, if there's gonna be a premium on carbon free assets, and there's gonna be a brown discount on assets that are not future proof. Right as simple as that and so it makes total sense for asset classes to ask the real estate sector give me metrics disclose how do you measure what's your benchmark i i really give me the transparency of the data so i can make better choices and that is and the gbc's around the world with their rating schemes and the advancing net zero program we have are pushing the envelope so we're saying uh, how we used to think about green buildings got us to a good point that there was a lot of uptake. We managed to get down the premiums of those buildings and now we can do them very efficiently. But what if we now go for net zero? What does it mean and how do we create greater demand? And this movement that you're saying of responsible investment and that disclosure will accelerate definitely that uptake. And as you said, can, how do we go for net zero? And you also mentioned the term measurability. And I'm curious to get your perspective on something we do here in the real estate community, which is you hear pledges sometimes of you know, net neutrality or, or net zero. Um, but what's oftentimes not talked about is that a significant portion of those reductions are through carbon offsets, um, as opposed to fundamental changes in the, the buildings. How do you feel about that? Like, I guess, and what is your view of carbon offsets and kind of the real estate industry's use of them today? So there's, there's also a debate here. So some, some, some people consider carbon offsets like demonic, like, oh no, you're not being true to going to net zero. But in a transition, right, you, you, you should minimize the offsets first and foremost. It's not you go and offset everything, right? You get to offsets when you have really achieved the highest energy efficiency possible you can today, right? And uh, you do the best of measures in terms of how do you, are you going to manage your building and any remaining balance, if you really cannot do it because the grid doesn't, hasn't been decarbonized and so many other factors, do go for offsets, but eventually we have to get to a point where they're not needed. But at this point in time, it's really, it's really, it's really hard for anyone to be truly net zero in most cases uh, without resorting to offsets. So it's, it's the cost of the transition. And as we have a greater market, we'll probably do away with them. Yeah, I, I hope that's the case, obviously, because yeah. you know, there, is this in, there is this inherent kind of optic, um, almost dissonance between, oh, someone's you know, net neutral, um, but then you realize, well, there's no fundamental change. And so I think what you're saying is, as long as the fundamental change is happening technologically at the building level to reduce its ongoing carbon emissions on an operational basis, that's what's critical, right? And if, and if offsets are a step function that kind of gets you there faster or accelerates that, that's a good thing. But I think the risk I always think about is that they can become, you can develop a dependence on them um, because you don't necessarily have to report on it externally. And, that brings me to another question, obviously, which is, um, you know, we did uh, some analysis around what it would take to decarbonize the, the U.S. real estate industry. 
and, and the numbers are staggering, right? I'm sure there's tons of different ways you can kind of creep up on this number, but it's in the trillions, right? Everyone agrees it, it's in the trillions to retrofit the existing U.S. building stock um, to the point where actual emissions are, are reduced to zero. And when we looked at that, we said, okay, because we're obviously looking at investing into the technology, the hardware solutions, the software solutions, the alternative energy solutions that are required to decarbonize the real estate industry. And as you and I were discussing, we found this shocking statistic, which is that the real estate industry has invested over the last 10 decades into climate tech only $100 million. The number is actually $96 million. So you think about a trillion dollar number and then you think about $96 million. So we're orders of magnitude off. I guess my question is, why do you think that's the case? The number was so shocking to me. Why do you think that's the case? I think traditionally, the, the industry, as I said already, is very, very conservative, yeah? And any, the challenge of innovating and getting better, better products will have be paired, to be paired with regulation and also consumer demand for this to fully change. Mm -hmm. um, as you said, decarbonizing the existing building stock, it's, it's a huge endeavor, but uh, Europe is, is showing the way in terms of regulation and ambition. The renovation wave that was recently announced, right, is going to inject billions of euros into this into this initiative, and we already have a network of cities in the Build Upon project at World GBC that are collaborating private sector and governments at local level to unlock, for example, the power of even existing regulation that you 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 should be doing these retrofits and they haven't happened, right, for several reasons getting the regulation right, getting the companies to collaborate and creating the market for it to be a business. Mm -hmm. And consumers to understand that lack of comfort, that leaky buildings, leaky energy buildings, it's just a waste of their, of their time. And it is also in the context of what, what we're living with COVID, it's unhealthy because it provides better quality. So we, we better convey those messages and get people to collaborate in that same space. I think we can unlock that market in a very ambitious way. There's a recent report by the International en Energy Agency just from June of this year that we're advocating, they're advocating for a green recovery, right? If, you, if you're gonna invest in recovering the economy in infrastructure, right, by, by deploying infrastructure, better do it green now, create good quality jobs and not go the other way. Why haven't we done that in the past? Because we haven't been pressured to rethink what is not really fit fit for purpose on the, on the great crisis that are upon us. And I guess as we are now risk averse to what climate change may, may, may come, as we're living a crisis, it's kind of a, a feeling that we cannot waste this crisis. <laughs> and we are finding a way how to connect the dots. Yeah, and, and in some ways the crisis I think we're all living through right now has thrust this like self-awareness awareness both on consumers but also on real estate owners to to internalize that their role as a real estate owner is more than just keeping the rain out right is more than just keeping the lights on that i think everyone now intimately understands that your public health and your personal health is so dependent on the decisions that your real estate owner is taking and I think about that lesson in light of some of the responses sometimes we get when we talk to real estate owners. And we mention this, we say, oh, how much are you investing into climate tech? And real estate owners will say, well, we did this solar deployment. And I said, no, no, not deployments, not deployments of technology. That's buying a product, but actual investments into the science, into the R&D that can take your building and take your assets cost efficiently into a carbon neutral future. And the number is almost always zero. And I ask the question, why? Well, why are you investing so little into the R&D to bring your buildings, your assets, your industry into this carbon neutral future? And the answer I get is that we're a real estate company. We don't do that. That's not our business. Our business is not to invest in R&D. I'm just curious, if you were sitting in my shoes, how would you respond to that when a real estate owner says that? I think that you're missing the opportunity of future-proofing your portfolio. You're missing the opportunity of understanding performance. And what you don't measure, you cannot manage. So if you're not measuring 
the energy you're consuming in your buildings. You're not putting energy systems in place. You are not, it's, it's not even, leave the carbon aside. Let's talk economics <laughs> and financials. If, if, if you just are building for today, not thinking on what, how is, how is the consumption going to happen throughout the years, you're just missing the opportunity to having high performance portfolios that are optimizing your resources. Hmm? And if you think of, if you're the owner of your office space, we also have for many years, there are several business ca case studies already published around the healthy buildings part, that productivity of people in offices with sustainability features make them more productive, better light quality, better air. There's a lot, and even the Harvard business studies from Joe Allen are amazing in that space. So it's, it just makes business sense to go this route. If you're not doing it, it's basically you're missing the opportunity to optimizing your investments. Yeah, and, and the, to some extent, I, I try to make that case. I always say, you know, no, it's not historically what you've done. And I think everyone appreciates that, that no, the real estate industry has not historically invested into the R&D of climate science. But doing what you've always done historically is usually the wrong side of history is usually not the right side of history. And I think what the real estate industry has the potential to do, given its outsized impact on climate change, is kind of shepherd the way for other industries. And you mentioned kind of public and private collaboration as at least one, one mechanism to achieve that. Like, what are some of the good examples you've seen of that globally, where the public sector and the private sector has come together around maybe both altruism and the kind of commercial imperative to decarbonize. Yeah, and I can give you developing country examples. For example, in, in, my, in my home city of Bogota in Colombia, right? Um, the Colombia Green Building Council, World GBC, and World Resources Institute, uh, let's say in collaboration through a program of the UN called a Building Efficiency Accelerator, right? Um, we got uh, the mayor, uh, Peñalosa, who already left office, and the secretary of planning, to uh, really work with a lot of stakeholders and figure out a way to improve the performance of all the new builds that the city is going to do in the next uh, decade. If, if, uh, so they approved a performance-based energy code for the city, meaning that the city is going to avoid like 30% of new emissions in the next 10 years. And it's a city that doesn't have a harsh climate. So that's showing that energy efficiency with public policy and servants that understand the conundrum, it can change the trajectory of the, of the built environment. And it, and, and it was made under very strict cost caps of what the measures that, the measures that were gonna be deployed. It's, it, it's an amazing work. In Mexico, in Mexico also there are examples of cities that say i want an energy performance system because i want to understand public my public buildings how are they performing how do i retrofit them they're kind of old i'm not going to wear them down I, I have i have too many priorities to invest in education and everything and we got a system in the city of yucatan also through the bea the building efficiency accelerator that is providing just that and so that creates public officials empowered by data to do better decisions on, oh, hey, what are the signals I'm gonna give? Because I'm not gonna be continuing to expand utilities in the era of renewables where the prices are at their historical lows. It doesn't make any sense that cities continue to grow through the planning of utilities and now we're seeing public transport, but that's another thing. <laughs> and so they're changing and they're shifting and now with better data, they be make better choices on how their cities develop. And in, and in Europe, there are several cases. It's, it's, it's a, of course, a hard space, but it takes, it, takes, it takes the determination and it takes the right people in the room and around the table that are committed to making a business case of an environmental priority that also, from a social perspective, delivers the other end of the spectrum of levering the, leveraging the playing field of higher quality, quality infrastructure for people. And I guess when you think about what the lessons are from those public-private partnerships and you think about what the next four years might look like in, in the U.S. And let's just pause it. And we're recording this on uh, October 28th, right? So the election is next Tuesday. Yeah. Pause it that we have a <laughs> green administration um, at the federal level. 
what do you think the next four years looks like in the United States? Like, what does that look like? Paint that picture for every real estate owner that's probably wondering this exact question of, we just had four years of not being a part of the Paris Agreement. With a green administration, what does that look like in the next four? Well, I think it would be the expectation that we see again international collaboration around, the, for example, the roadway, the long roadway to COP26 and the ambition of, of a, what's going to be the new commitments, the new ambitious commitments around net zero. It is called the net zero COP. Uh, so I would, see, I would say, Brendan, that basically it would be, again, bringing the U.S. leadership in terms of roadmaps for getting this net zero, uh, let's say, transition underway. In a, in a meaningful space where there is collaboration also with the leadership that China is taking to decarbonize by 2060, Europe by 2050. So I would expect that the U.S. has a goal at least by 2050. And uh, that would be very meaningful because then that creates markets. It creates the right signal and people get inspired to say, hey, what can I, if that's going to be the case first, of course. What's the opportunity, but also what's my responsibility to make this happen in a world where we're seeing renewables are changing the game. Right. And last question I want to ask, um, because you know, there's a lot of people that obviously care about this issue and that it's, it's deeply important to them, but are not part of the real estate industry. They are just kind of in other industries or just going about their lives. And I guess the question is, what can the consumer and what can the tenant do to affect change in the real estate industry. So taking aside all the real estate CEOs that we've talked about and their incentives and what they should or shouldn't do and administration change, what should the individual do to affect change in this highly contributive industry to climate change of real estate? Like what should they do? So one could be when you go to a bank, right? And you're gonna ask for a mortgage, ask if they have green loans or if they can have green mortgages, right? And so ask them what portfolios would they benefit? And if they don't, well, don't give them their, your money. Find a bank that is really supporting green mortgages and understands what's the quality of the, of the projects, yeah? Second, I would say also care about the performance of your energy. Uh, understand if you can improve. Uh, several several cities already have, for example, in the U.S., you have Green Star, right, ratings, and you have LEED, and, and there's other standards that give you a sense of performance of the quality. What does the space do for your energy consumption? What does the space do for your health and well-being? So ask, ask about the attributes of the building and, and really take a closer look at what's the, the feel, the light, the ventilation, Ask about if it has appliances that are energy efficient too, and and think about what what the space is going to do also for you. Not only yeah, and and I guess making the questions and asking, for example, if mater the materials used in the paintings do not have VOCs that make you sick and babies uh, are exposed to chemicals asking questions and trying to figure out what's the labeling scheme, what does it tell me about performance, and educating educating yourself in terms of what can be, what can the space do for you. I totally agree, and I think that when consumers start asking those questions, obviously, of landlords, the hope is that landlords internalize that this isn't just regulators, this isn't just capital markets, this is a this is a movement that is driven by the demand side for real estate and the demand side can affect change too. And I think that's inspiring. And I think real estate owners are slowly, uh, but gradually uh, appreciating that. So um, Christina, it, it, it's been that's a wonderful. pleasure to talk to you. Um, just so interesting hearing about all the work, the really important work that, that you're doing. And I just wanted to thank you for, for joining me. No, thank you, Brendan, for the invitation. It's so inspiring to see how you're taking on this challenge and how you are inspiring others to, to take on sustainability seriously. And, and of course, how does a carbon-free world look for real estate? Uh, there's a path to travel, and I'm very happy to be traveling with all of you. Yeah, and I'm very happy you're on that path. And so hopefully we can we can actually make that a reality. So thank you again, and thank you, thank everyone. You. For, for listening.